that we begin. I'm thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Kiskit Seminar series dedicated to you, the research and academic communities. I am your host, Lako Minute from IBM Quantum Research, and today I have the pleasure and personal privilege of hosting Peter McMahon, Professor in Applied and Engineering Physics at Cornell University, who will talk about physical neural networks, harnessing complex dynamics to perform machine learning. Peter uh, completed his PhD in postdoctoral training at Stanford University. Uh, Peter is the recipient of the Packard Fellowship, Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Program, and a Google Quantum Research Award, and a CIFAR Azrael Global Scholar in Quantum Information Science, go CIFAR. Uh, and of course, Peter is actually, uh, I, I would like to recognize Peter here with a very special award that is unannounced to him and to uh, any, anyone else yet. And that award is that Peter is our first Kiskit Seminar speaker to have come back and given a second talk. So congratulations, Peter. I think uh, it means folks really like to hear you talk. So I can't wait for you to get into this. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks very much, Lako. It's, uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to be back. Thanks so much for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to sharing this work with the audience. Lovely. Uh, take it away. Great. So let's, uh, let's dive into it. Um, so as, uh, as uh, Zlatko already announced, the uh, topic and title of the talk is Physical Neural Networks, uh, How We Can harness, harness Complex Dynamics to Perform Machine Learning. And I should give a, a caveat right at the front, uh, because this is the Kiskit Quantum Seminar. Uh, and it's very important that I tell you that most of what I'm going to tell you about today is about classical systems. And so right at the end of the talk, there's going to be a a future outlook for how this can also be applied to quantum uh, quantum systems, but I don't want uh, anyone to sit through most of the talk wondering where, where is the quantum? Is everything quantum? Where was where was the quantum part? Uh, almost everything is going to be classical. All of the experimental results I'm going to show are classical, and then there's going to be the uh, the outlook switching to quantum at the end. Uh, but before we dive into that, I wanted to quickly give acknowledgments to the people who actually did the work. Uh, I'm really just here to do the, the advertising or the marketing of the work that happens within my group. Uh, all the hard stuff gets, uh, gets done by the actual students and postdocs that are, that are in the lab daily. Uh, and so this, uh, this set of people are the people in my group. And uh, this work was funded partially by NTT and uh, the National Science Foundation. So thanks very much to them. And I will highlight as I go through kind of more specific people of who made, who made the kind of main contributions that I'll be talking about today. So the overall outline of uh, what I'm going to cover today is, first of all, I'm going to give a quick introduction to neural networks and why and how we may want to improve their energy efficiency, because the, uh, the goal of physical neural networks, uh, one of the goals of uh, our work in this area has been to try to develop a way to produce neural networks that might be more energy efficient or faster than uh, conventional approaches. And so I wanted to sort of, for anybody who is uh, not super familiar with neural networks to at least get you up to the basic level of background knowledge so that you can understand the rest of the talk. Uh, for those of you who are already experts on neural networks, you can maybe relax and tune out a little bit in the first part. Uh, and then in the, uh, the main part of the talk is going to be our description of how we can build neural networks out of arbitrary physical systems. So there are some caveats on this, but more or less, any physical system you give us, we can tell you how to build a neural network out of it. Uh, sort of catch, but we can't promise you whether it'll be a good or bad neural network necessarily for any particular task, but we'll be able to build a neural network. And I'll show you experimental results of us actually succeeding at building relatively good neural networks uh, out of some rather surprising physical systems. Then, uh, everything up until that point will have been classical. Uh, since this is a quantum seminar, I feel like I'm morally obliged to, uh, to include some quantumness in this, which is to say how we can uh, extend our general sort of framework for thinking about building physical neural networks out of physical systems from systems that are classical to systems that are quantum. And I'll try to also put this in the context of other work that's been happening very intensively over the past few years on the field of quantum neural networks. So let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, 
So the first uh, concept I'd like to quickly recap or introduce for those who, who haven't seen it is the notion of, in machine learning, inference versus training. Uh, and the reason that I want to introduce this uh, and, uh, and emphasize it is that for the work that I'm going to be describing today, uh, what we're going to be targeting is making improvements in inference, not in training. And so if, you, if I didn't give you this little intro, you might start wondering later on in the talk, well, ah, this isn't going to help with training because X, Y, and Z, which would be a fair statement. Uh, so I'm going to emphasize what is inference about and also why is it interesting to focus on inference as the thing we want to improve. So inference in machine learning is the operation in machine learning where you're given some trained model and some uh, data that, for example, you would like to classify. Uh, and this might be an, exa an example of this is uh, you might have some handwritten digit that's shown here as this handwritten digit of an eight. And you put this into the model and you get the model to make a prediction of uh, or classification of what that digit is. And so in this case, a correct answer would be, well, this is an eight. Training is oh, yeah. oh, a I different. Say... Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that th that eight looks like my handwriting. I don't know if anything could recognize it. <laughs> Go <laughs> ahead. You have, uh, you have pretty good, canonically good handwriting for machine learning uh, benchmark tests then. Uh, maybe if I need any more training data, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll drop you an email and ask you to write some digits for me. <laughs> uh, so training is the, uh, uh, is the sort of other side of the coin in machine learning. If, well, in inference, you have to use some trained model. Where does that trained model come from? Well, somebody has to produce it. and. Training is the procedure for producing a, a model. And uh, what you, what's generally happening here is you're given some training data set where you have a bunch of labeled data where, for example, here there are a bunch of handwritten zeros written by different people or Zlatko writing in different ways, different times. Uh, and each of these in the data set, we're, set we're, we're told these are all zeros. And here's a bunch of handwritten ones, and we're told these are all ones, etc. So given this data set of of labeled handwritten digits, uh, the goal in training is to produce a model that can make predictions. And this model is then the thing that gets, uh, gets used within the inference phase. And so in this work, we're going to be focusing on how to improve the inference phase, but the inference phase uses a trained model, so we have to worry about how to actually do the training as well, even if we're not going to make improvements to the training uh, per se. So Another important fact about machine learning in the, in the modern world, in the modern era, is that inference costs can dominate, where costs can mean total amount of energy used, total amount of dollars required, total amount of carbon emissions, etc. So for several different definitions of cost, inference costs can dominate. And so you can, in some situations, you can uh, think of maybe 80 to 90 percent of the total cost of machine learning is an inference rather than training. And intuitively, this is uh, kind of reasonable. You can think about this as being a result of, in many cases, you have some small team of machine learning engineers training a model, developing it, and then they deploy it to the cloud. And then hundreds of thousands or millions of people may end up using that model to do inference. Uh, to pick a random example, imagine Google Translate. Uh, some team of Google engineers produces the model that can perform translations uh, between languages from French to English or English to French, etc. Uh, but once they've trained that model, they can put it on servers in the cloud and then literally millions of people around the planet each day can use Google Translate to make uh, inference requests of it. And so this, this uh, disparity between the size of people doing the training and the number of people using it is, is partially what you can think of as causing the fact that uh, or resulting in the fact that inference costs may dominate. Just so that it's not just me telling you this and claiming it, I can give some references of where, where, where are people saying uh, these numbers. For example, uh, Amazon a couple of years ago when they announced the development of an inference chip that was a special purpose ASIC developed for doing inference, uh, put in their blog post announcing it that uh, yeah, inference accounts for up to 90% of the machine learning workloads that they, uh, that they can see. Uh, there's a similar statement from uh, NVIDIA, also from a couple of years ago, and a similar statement from, uh, from McKinsey, also a few years ago. So this is a kind of fairly well-established 
effect. And so we're, we're going to be targeting inference. So now uh, I've just described machine learning inference in general. Uh, I'd now like to describe a very, very brief overview of, of neural networks and how neural networks uh, or artificial neural networks work. So again, the inference task is given some, for example, a handwritten digit, uh, make a prediction of what digit it was, and a very canonical description of a neural network to perform this task uh, and <clears throat> sort of visual representation of this is shown here where we have layers of so-called neurons uh, and this the fact that there are multiple layers is uh, what uh, is why we have the, the name deep and deep learning <laughs> and each of these circles represents a single neuron and we put the input uh, information, this uh, handwritten digit, we encode this in the first layer of neurons. So for example, you might map the first top left pixel to the first neuron, the next pixel to the next neuron, the next pixel to the next neuron, etc. And then the information gets propagated through this neural network where uh, the mathematical operation that happens in the most canonical form of a neural network, it doesn't happen in all, but in kind of a very canonical form called the multilayer perceptron, you propagate information from the first layer of neurons to the next layer of neurons by doing a matrix vector multiplication. What is the vector? What is the matrix here? The vector is this set of neurons that was the, the input layer uh, that you can represent as a vector where each neuron has some numerical value. Uh, and so each of these neurons is an element of a vector. And then the matrix is a matrix that describes the connections from each neuron in this layer to each neuron in the next layer. Uh, so these kind of weights of connections between, uh, between neurons are encoded in the elements of a matrix. Then the next uh, important operation that happens after this is that you now have propagated information from this layer to the next by applying, by performing a matrix vector multiplication. You then need to apply a, an element-wise nonlinearity where each uh, uh, neuron is uh, the value that came from the, the propagated from the previous layer that had kind of all these inputs to it and it's summed up. Once that's all happened, then you apply an element-wise nonlinear function, uh, and then you repeat this. So you then do a matrix vector multiplication and apply an element-wise nonlinearity, et cetera, on the next layer, and then the next layer, and eventually uh, you will get some output that typically will be more than a single neuron as shown here, but will be some, some output layer that's some vector that will encode the answer. And the, uh, the training procedure in this is that the weights of these uh, connections between neurons or equivalently the elements of the, matrix, the matrices that connect these layers are the values that get trained during training. So during the training procedure, these, uh, these weights get fiddled until when you put in an 8, the network outputs the answer 8. When you put in 7s, the network outputs 7s with high probability, etc. So... Given that that's the general, very general, very simplistic scheme of how artificial neural networks work, what are the ways in which one could make hardware accelerators that could try to make this process more energy efficient? And I put accelerators in air quotes here uh, because this is the name that the community uses for special purpose hardware to uh, perform machine learning or neural network processing, but it's sometimes slightly a misnomer because normally what one is trying to do is not trying to make the inference go faster, uh, but trying to make it happen more energy efficiently. Uh, but nevertheless, accelerators are the name that people use for this, so I will, I will use the same name. So what are, what are some options for if you would like to try and make a special purpose piece of hardware for performing inference of neural networks more energy efficient? Well, there's two sort of you could break it up into two maybe conceptual ways to do this. One is you could try to design a hardware accelerator that has an exact mathematical equivalence with what I just showed the mathematical operations on the previous slide. And another option is to have one that is more approximate. So the mathematical operations that were involved were these uh, matrix vector multiplications, which were the, really the, the most intensive arithmetic operations in the neural network processing. And then there's also the element-wise nonlinearities, but generally the, the matrix vector multiplications are what use the, the, the most number of arithmetic operations in the, in, the, in the calculation of an inference pass. So you could try to build a hardware that uh, is a special purpose piece of hardware that 
performs matrix vector multiplication uh, as effective as efficiently as possibly as possible and a pro to doing this is that if you produce this hardware and it exactly does these matrix vector multiplications then you can take whatever model you train in the, in the usual setting of it with a CPU or GPU or TPU etc and you can directly run it on your uh, your new piece of hardware that is your new proposed accelerator because the mathematically it's doing an identical thing the con of doing this is that you now need to very carefully engineer your hardware so that it exactly does the matrix vector multiplications that the, the model is uh, assuming that you're, you're going to be able to do or that you're doing and by insisting that you really carefully engineer the hardware to do exactly this mathematical operation, you now then tend to have to design things in a way where they don't operate quite as efficiently or as fast as uh, would be possible because you want it to be really careful about doing exactly this operation. So you leave some energy on the table by doing this. But the, there is a big pro is that now it's just a drop-in replacement. An alternative approach uh, is don't try make your hardware accelerator exactly do this operation. You can make it do something that approximately does this. And in this way, you can make the hardware much more energy efficient because you're now no longer insisting on having this exact equivalence. On the minus side, though, if you do this, now your machine learning model will need to be retrained because uh, it, you didn't retrain it, it would be doing the wrong thing when it ran on the hardware because it wasn't an exact equivalence. So there is a trade-off here, but uh, what we're going to discuss in this talk is something that's more sort of philosophically similar to this rather than the exact equivalence. But there is a large portion of the literature in this field of uh, novel hardware accelerators for machine learning that are really trying to, to do the exact thing uh, and so I wanted to sort of set up what we were doing in the context of there's many works, including some in my group, that try to do this, but we're also uh, able to think about doing things that are a little more exotic and a little more sort of mathematically, I don't know about sloppy, but uh, uh, not, 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 not exactly uh, doing the mathematical operations that a, a GPU would have done. Something that uh, I'd like to point out is that I've set up this dichotomy of exact and approximate mathematical equivalence as the two options, but really uh, what we're going to see very shortly is that approximate is even uh, too strict. It turns out that you don't even need to make accelerators that, uh, that, that have an approximate equivalence with, with how these artificial neural networks work, that you can even make accelerators that are just sort of vaguely inspired by the mathematical structure of artificial neural networks that have been so successful in uh, kind of almost all domains of industry and science now over the last decade, and you can still get it to work. So that perhaps is a little bit abstract, but we're going to make it very concrete very soon. So now let's let's dive into the the actual set of work that that, that my group has done. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about how we can build neural networks out of physical systems, and we're going to do it in a way that is quite exotic and is not trying to make matrix vector multipliers uh, that are more, much more energy efficient than a, than a, than a CPU. We're going to try to do things in a more exotic way. And this work was led by Logan Wright and Tatsuhiro Onodera, who are two postdocs in my group, and uh, they were ably assisted by a junior grad student uh, who was learning the ropes from them, uh, but contributed a lot to this project as well, Martin Stein. So the, again, the problem we want to tackle is to try and uh, make neural networks where the inference uh, can be done more energy efficiently. And the intuition and the, the promise of doing this with physical systems is going to be something that's very much inspired by uh, the way Feynman motivated the development of quantum simulators. So Feynman, I think for this audience, I, I can definitely uh, use the analogy without worrying that people haven't heard of it before. Uh, Feynman's argument, of course, was that simulating quantum systems on classical computers uh, is, in general, exponentially difficult. And so he made the argument that, well, maybe we can turn things around and say, well, if that's really hard, why don't we build a computer or a quantum simulator out of quantum uh, objects themselves? And then that 
uh, quantum simulator will be much more powerful than what we could have achieved classically. And you can apply the same intuition in, a, in this slightly different setting of many physical systems, even classical ones, are very expensive to simulate on digital computers in both energy and in time. And so it's not just quantum systems that are really can be really hard to simulate on digital computers. And why might they be expensive to simulate in, uh, to simulate some physical system on a, on a digital classical computer? Uh, well, you can imagine abstract things like networks of coupled oscillators. If you have enough coupled oscillators, this can be uh, start to become challenging to simulate. But that's still kind of abstract. Maybe a, a more really real concrete example is uh, imagining simulating the Navier-Stokes equations for fluid flow. So if we put a model of a car or an aircraft wing or something like that in a wind tunnel, and we turn on the wind, within, let's say, a second or two seconds or so, we'll end up getting, uh, having the system compute some distribution of pressures and velocities of all the particles, uh, and uh, just naturally does it because of the dynamics of the wind tunnel. Whereas if you wanted to try simulate the situation uh, using the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, depending on how accurately you want an answer, uh, this may be something that's actually very compute intensive to compute. You may, you may end up needing to use a compute cluster for sort of several hours or days. Uh, and so this gives one example of a case where a very classical physics still is very challenging to simulate on digital uh, electronic classical computers. Uh, and I think any, uh, anyone who's listening to this who has worked in superconducting circuits and uh, has simulated uh, Maxwell's equations for the design of the electronic circuits will fully appreciate this point that even though Maxwell's equations are, uh, are classical uh, and you, so they're simulable in polynomial time, uh, still uh, it can take a lot of compute resources and a lot of time uh, to simulate to uh, at least some level of accuracy that you may desire. Uh, so this is hopefully an intuitive notion that it's not just quantum systems that are hard to simulate. So then we can do the Feynman-esque argument of, well, given that there are physical, classical physical systems that are hard to simulate, why don't we turn the situation around and somehow use physical classical systems that are hard to simulate to perform some computations that were expensive for us to perform otherwise. And instead of trying to do this in complete generality, uh, so we're not going to try make the classical equivalent of a, of a quantum computer which can perform, uh, is universal and can perform any task, let's try to specialize this to the case of neural networks. So how can we try to harness a difficult to simulate classical physical system and make it behave as a neural network for us? So that's the specific subset of computing that we're going to be tackling in this work. So the, the general scheme is the following. Now I've drawn a diagram or have a diagram at the bottom of the slide that you can think about as basically a redrawing of uh, a deep neural network that could have just been a standard artificial neural network for classifying, for example, handwritten aids. And each gray box here now, instead of drawing the pictures of, uh, of neurons that I showed before, I'm just going to represent each kind of collection of neurons in a layer as this uh, as a gray box. And so this is a representing a several layer deep neural network for classifying eights where this could very well be representing just a standard conventional artificial neural network. And we send the input image into the network. It's an input to this layer. This layer performs some processing on it. It gets, comes out, gets sent to the next layer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until it comes out. And ideally, you produce some, for example, probability distribution where it says, OK, with high probability, this is an 8. And these parameters here are inputs to each layer, which in the case of a conventional artificial neural network uh, that I, that I descri described uh, previously, these would be the weights uh, or the matrix elements of the, the weight matrices that happen within each group. Uh, gray box here, which would be a, a matrix vector multiplication that's going on inside here. So that's the interpretation of this bottom diagram in terms of a 
conventional artificial neural network, but we ask the question of, well, what, what happens if this gray box is not just a conventional layer of a conventional artificial neural network? What happens if, because there's nothing to say that uh, an artificial neural network has to be made with a matrix vector multiplication uh, or even a convolutional layer, etc. This could have been something much more different. And so we ask the question, well, what happens if you replace this gray box layer here, each layer, with not some matrix vector multiplication, but with some physical system, where the physical system is going to perform a transformation from input data to output data by undergoing some dynamics. So you pass into this physical system some input data, as well as some parameters, and then you let the physical system evolve for some amount of time, and then you read out the state of the system, and it gives you, from that state, some output. And that, uh, although the physical system is a continuous time thing, uh, if you make it evolve for some set amount of time, uh, this is performing some input-output mapping from these inputs here containing the parameters and the input data to some output. And it's not necessarily doing a matrix vector multiplication, and in general it won't be, uh, but it's doing some mapping of inputs to outputs. And what we're going to explore is, well, what happens if you do this with different physical systems? Can you actually make this kind of thing do machine learning for you? And Peter, maybe we're jumping the gun here with this question a little bit, and we'll get into it. But um, you, you get a lot of kind of built-in, usually noise resiliency with digital systems that analog systems are more susceptible to. Um, Maybe you'll comment more on that later. Sure, yeah, it's a great point. Uh, and to a large extent, one of the major technical contributions of our work was in describing a training procedure that lets you do this in practice with a real experiment in the lab and have it actually work. Uh, because if you're going to rely on analog dynamics, uh, you, in general, will have this problem uh, that analog systems have noise. and parameter and precision and so on. Uh, and so we had to be quite careful in designing the way we train the network to be resilient to that. Uh, and that will be coming up on in a slide or two. But it's a great, a great question, a great seg. So before I get to kind of how we train it, uh, I wanted to quickly make this a little bit more concrete of like, okay, well, this could be any physical system. What kinds of things could be physical systems that we could do? When I say any, I really mean pretty much any physical system. Uh, here are three examples. This could be some optical system. For example, this could be uh, a nonlinear optical crystal that performs frequency conversion. Or you send light in of one color, and it comes out another color. Um, it could be some mechanical system. So it could be some uh, system of pendula. It could be what's depicted here is a sheet of metal that's being shaken. So that's a, a multi-mode mechanical oscillator. Uh, it could be some electronic circuit, but not necessarily a digital circuit, but some complex uh, analog electronic oscillator. Uh, for example, uh, some RLC circuit with a transistor in it, so that it have some complex analog dynamics. Uh, and pretty much anything else you think of uh, that's a physical system that has some way for you to put data into it and some way for you to read out the state later is a potential candidate for building a, a neural network out of a physical system where you could do it in this deep way by replacing each block, each uh, gray box here with some physical systems dynamics. So that's the, the, the general concept of what we're going to try to do. So we're going to try build neural networks in this way where each of these boxes are going to be physical systems. And to make this even more concrete, I'm going to show one example here for now of what of one system that we constructed in the lab. And uh, this neural network that's shown here is a, we implemented this as a five layer neural network where the task that's depicted here is not a handwritten digit classification anymore, but uh, a, sim a simpler task, which is a, a vowel classification. So somebody speaks a vowel and, and we get given some uh, representation of that electronically. And the neural network's task is to predict well, what vowel was the person saying. And so in this example, uh, what's depicted here is there's some histogram on the output where uh, the vowel classifications by the sort of linguistics people, uh, they're uh, 
uh, saying that this, the, this one here, the class is R. And the way that we constructed this, uh, this neural network was with optics. And the, the heart of the system was this uh, crystal that's shown in the middle here that's uh, that denoted a second harmonic generation, which is the technical nonlinear optics term for frequency conversion, where one is uh, uh, doubling the, the, the frequency of the light. So you, you start with uh, two photons that are red, and then the system kind of bunches them together and turns them into a single blue photon. And the, so this was the, the system that is going to exhibit the complex dynamics. Then one needs to ask, well, how do we encode data into this? How do we encode parameters? And then how do we read out what transformation this crystal performed? And in uh, this experiment, what we did is we started with a pulsed laser that has some broadband frequency spectrum that's shown here of between 770 and 775-ish nanometers. And we passed this pulse through a pulse shaper, which is a device in optics that uses a couple of gratings and a spatial light modulator to let you shape the frequency of the pulse. And we encoded into the, the pulse shaper information about the input data. So what are the vowel, at least at the first layer, it's kind of what is the vowel, spoken vowel, audio waveform, processed audio waveform values. Um, and then the parameters, which are things we're going to learn during training of this neural network. These are put onto the pulse shaper, and these imprint uh, a new shape onto the spectrum of the light. So you start with this kind of smooth, not quite Gaussian a shape, but you now imprint uh, a bunch of values onto the spectrum, and so you get this kind of wiggly spectrum that's shown here. And then this get, that's can set, this uh, pulse that then gets sent through the uh, nonlinear crystal, and it converts the frequency of the of these various different frequency components, performing kind of summing of them, so that you uh, you get out uh, light that's approximately blue, and you can see a sample output spectrum here of light that's between 386 and 387 nanometers. You can see there's some kind of wiggly spectrum, and this gets measured on a spectrometer. So the, the, this here is actual experimental data from a measurement of a single pass of this, where you took the light and I'll put it onto a grating. It spread the light out, the light's colors out, and you measure it on a, on a camera, and you can see its spectrum. And so sending light into this crystal and having it come out and reading out the spectrum is one layer of the neural network. So it's one of these gray blocks. And then from each block to the next, we are then taking the output spectrum and then encoding that as the input to the next layer and then a different set of parameters. So there's a, these parameters here are representations of the real parameters that we use, that each layer we use different parameters, and we're propagating the information of input spectrum, gets a new output spectrum, and then we encode it as the input spectrum to the next layer, but with a different set of parameters. And this was then trained to perform file classification, where here you'll have to take my word for it that uh, this was getting a correct answer. If we put in a spectrum corresponding to the vowel R, that uh, a, a vector of input corresponding to the vowel R, that if you look at the output spectrum of the light at the, at the final layer, uh, we can bin the spectrum and look at which bin had the highest power in it, and it turns out that this one did, and this one happened to correspond to the correct, the, the vowel that was actually put in. So this is an example of a pretty simple physical neural network, but uh, it's hopefully an example of one where it's clear that there was no real connection between the physics of second harmonic generation and spoken vowels spoken by humans. So it wasn't like we designed a physical system that somehow was really matching very carefully the task we were trying to do. Uh, and this is maybe suggestive of some, uh, not complete generality, but some notion that uh, physical systems may be able to perform machine learning on tasks that you otherwise wouldn't expect them to be able to. And I will show some more examples of this soon. But now we, we can get to, uh, to Zlatko's question to explain how did we actually train this to work. So there are two key things that uh, we needed to do and wanted to do. So the first was that we wanted to be able to train these neural networks using gradient descent, using backpropagation. And one of the main reasons for wanting to do this is that uh, 
gradient descent via backprop has been the workhorse of deep neural networks for the past 10 plus years. And it's been enormously successful in training very large, very accurate neural networks. So we wanted to try leverage this. We don't want to try and invent a new way to do neural, neural networks that doesn't leverage everything that the, of all of the amazing work that the machine learning community has already developed. We want to try and build on that as much as possible. And it's clear that gradient descent with backprop is an enormously powerful tool. A tricky thing, though, is that in a physical system, how do you perform gradient descent with backpropagation when you, how would you get gradients? Uh, how, backprop you can think of as being kind of related to the chain rule in calculus. Of how do you perform chain rule backwards through your physical system to get out how each physical parameter is changing the output? The key idea, or one of the key ideas that we, we had was let's, use a differentiable digital model of our physical system as the thing that we're going to use during training. If we have a digital model, so some computer code that describes what the physical system is doing, uh, we can use, uh, again, lovely tools that have been developed by the uh, differentiable programming and machine learning community over the last decade to be able to produce uh, gradients for our physical system so long as our digital model is accurate enough. The second key idea uh, is that, and this really gets to, to Zlatko's point, is that if we just use the digital model, uh, we would expect we, we might not we might expect that this this whole scheme would be difficult to get to work because there's noise in analog systems that is really difficult to control, um, and so we had to introduce a training procedure where we can somehow train the system in a way that it becomes robust to noise. And we, we call this physics-aware training in homage to quantization-aware training in conventional machine learning. So if you know what quantization-aware training is, uh, then you can think about this as the, the extension of that to our setting. If you don't, I will explain it soon, so uh, it, it will hopefully become clear. So the training procedure that we settle on is the following is we have some physical system, and when we train it, we're going to send in some input data and some choice of the parameters that are not yet optimal. So they don't, if you put in an eight, it doesn't yet give you, give you the answer eight uh, uh, with, with uh, as high an accuracy as you would like yet. You send this through the physical system. And the physical system produces some output, and let's say you, you're really putting the handwritten eight in and you wanted this, the, the output here to be a peak at eight. So that's the target. That's what's shown in black. But the actual output you got is shown in blue. So there's some overlap with the 8, which is good, but you want that to be higher, and you want all the other ones to be low, because you really did put an 8, and so it shouldn't be telling you that it was a 0 or 1 or a 2, etc. And then in a laptop, you can compute the error vector. So you can say, well, what is the difference between the target and the output? So this is the error vector, and this you know exactly, because you, you've measured it, and you know what the right answer is. And this error vector is then something you can feed back in the laptop through a differentiable digital model in, uh, that you can uh, compute that you perform backprop on using, for example, the PyTorch package. And this will then produce gradients that tell you how you should update your parameters such, such that you minimize this error. You then update your parameters and you send it through the physical system again. This will give you then some new uh, output vector that you can then compute the error on again, etc. And you can and you can go round and round uh, and, until you minimize the error. Peter, can you say something about the top right corner number three step, like the digitization step that's happening there, and and you know some algorithms you might have some kind of exponential scaling on the size of that step that you needed to become like really small, or you know maybe if you could just comment a little more on that. Sure. So uh, one thing about the digitization is uh, uh, there's a notion that there's now like a discrete vector that's coming out of here. And that is uh, maybe suggestive of the kind of thing that's going on here, where we have some spectrum that comes out of a spectrometer, and then we, we can choose to bin this however we would like. And so if we choose to bin it like this, then this becomes a, what's it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dimensional vector that comes out. Uh, but we get some choice over how to how to discretize from the continuous uh, 
quantity that comes out of the system to some discrete thing that we're going to be able to work with in a laptop. And uh, you, you generally uh, will get more power if you can bin it more finely. Uh, if you bin it too coarsely, then you're kind of throwing away information. But at the same time, there's some trade-off there because if you bin it too finely, then maybe you have too much noise to really be able to kind of practically work with the, the different bins, if that made sense. Um, and, uh, I, guess the, I, guess the, I, I don't know if you really wanted to clarify kind of what else you had in mind by that question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I guess the algorithms that you're looking at, the simulations you're looking at, um, the resource requirement that they demand on, on that kind of uh, binning resolution is not going to scale in such a way, or it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be really, yeah, how, how to, uh, but basically your binning is, you know, if you had to do a million bins, that might start to get tricky. Or if you had to do binning that's smaller than some resolution, that might have to get tricky. So I guess this kind of places a particular uh, kind of constraint on the models and systems that you're thinking about or the simulations. Right. Yeah, I think there's a, there's essentially a trade-off here of that. Uh, from some perspective, you would like to make the binning as fine as possible and kind of have the vector coming out of this physical system be as high dimensional as possible because that's then suggestive of uh, the physical system doing sort of as much work for you as possible. But this needs to be counterbalanced by the fact that if you bin too finely, then you you may not be able to uh, you, you may you may have trouble with noise. And so maybe something very concrete one can say about this is uh, in the ideal case, what you want is that when you put the same inputs into a physical system, that you get the same output. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we train and every time the physical system does something different, then we're never going to be able to train it really accurately because it's always, it's always jumping around. So you don't want to bin so finely that uh, that you can't really use the, the outputs because by bending finally, you've started to sort of get into the noise. And uh, there'll be, for any different physical system, some trade-off that you want to make there of kind of all like, you want to make this as large as possible, this output vector as large as possible, but not larger, uh, where, where you're limited by kind of how much noise there there is in the output, and each different physical system will behave in different ways. So I don't think it's necessarily something super generic one can say about it. Well, how big will that be? It'll be dependent on the system. Uh, but I think what you're suggesting is going to generically be true for any system that there'll be some limit in which you shouldn't go larger. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so you're going to keep the input and output space size roughly the same. Got it. Thanks. Um, the input and output space sizes don't have to be the same, um, but uh, it's fair, I think fairly typical that one would have them be kind of roughly similar. Uh, it, it, it would be a little odd in our neural network to go from something really high dimensional to something super low dimensional in one step. Like you can change the dimensions along the way, and this is a, not an uncommon thing to happen in a neural network, but uh, huge changes are probably suggestive that oh, somehow you're throwing away information, which sometimes you want to do, but uh, in many cases you don't. So, uh, sure. So. That's that's how the general procedure that we design works. If you do forward passes through the physical system and backward passes through this differentiable digital model, and in this way, uh, you can think about how this helps you is that by always using the physical physical system in, in the forward pass, you're keeping the system, the, the, the training procedure grounded in what the reality of what the physical system is actually doing. So it is not going to go into very weird parts of parameter space where it gets actually very wrong answers because the simulation told it that that's what was good. Uh, if that doesn't actually correspond to what really happens with the physical system, because the real the real physical system is what's being used to compute the errors. Uh, another way to that is maybe helpful to think about why this is a a good thing to do is that. If you only relied on the digital model to train the system, and then only once you've trained, then you put the parameters and outputs on the physical system to try it out, uh, you, you will need to have made this digital model really accurate so that it can get the gradients really right. But if you insist, if you have the, if you fit the physical system into the into the loop here, now you can intuitively think that the digital model only needs to be good enough so that the gradients that it computes are at least in the right direction. If they're in the wrong direction, then it's 
bad. So if it's telling you you should move this, move this up when you should actually be moving it down, then then the training won't proceed well. But as uh, so long as the gradients are in the correct direction, this thing can at least make progress, uh, and it doesn't need to be. Uh, the, the gradients don't need to be exactly quantitatively accurate. Whereas if you if you only use the digital model, uh, you would you would tend to find that the the training procedure then kind of runs you off when the gradient is slightly wrong. And you end up in a very wrong place. And I will show experimental data of that very shortly, which is here is a plot of showing for uh, the uh, vowel classification again. So this task that we that I that I introduced here and showed an example in optical neural network, showing what happens as you train this. So uh, epoch on the x-axis here is telling you essentially how many times have you kind of gone around this loop with the data set, um, and uh, the y-axis is what ac accuracy do you get of classifying these different vowels. And if we use this procedure uh, shown above here, where we have the forward pass in the loop, then we see that after some number of training epochs, uh, you, uh, you end up being able to achieve 93% accuracy on this task, which is a pretty reasonable uh, accuracy for this particular machine learning benchmark. However, if you only use the digital model, so you do your forward pass through the digital model and you do the backward pass through the differentiable digital model, uh, and then you run, uh, uh, during training, it will think it's doing great. And then if you run the actual parameters that you get uh, on the real physical system, you find that you just basically get noise near the level of random guessing. And that's because the digital model was not accurate enough, even though we actually tried to make the models accurate. Uh, it, it turns out that making a really quantitatively accurate model of an analog system is really difficult. Um, and so this, uh, this shows that uh, the, the, the sort of thing that Zlatko was suggesting earlier, that this may be really hard to achieve, uh, is true if you use a, a purely in silico training approach, but if you use this physics aware training approach that uh, intuitively should make you more robust to noise, then it actually does manage to succeed, at least for this simple task and this one particular physical system. So, quick so question not, from the audience here. Uh, can I call from Jenai, can I call the physical system more sort of a robust bottleneck feature generator? Um, I think calling it a feature generator is very reasonable um, in the same sense that uh, different layers in a conventional artificial neural network you can think about as generating features and then uh, maybe even up until the final layer where then you're kind of finding the combination of features that, that gives you a good classification. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a bottleneck. Like you can design layers where they're bottlenecks, but you can also design ones where they're not necessarily bottlenecks. And uh, robust, well, I, I would say that we've shown that we've been able to show that we can make the training happen in a robust way. So the the physical system itself might not be robust in some sense, but the, the training procedure can uh, find a way to use it in a way that is reasonably robust. Gotcha. While we're there, uh, any other burning questions from the audience, Slatko? Um, let, um, I haven't quite read this one, so let me just read it out loud. Physical systems also offer us a better built-in, inbuilt per, uh, para, well, parallelization in some cases than digital simulators might that run into memory that might run into memory compute issues is it possible to exploit that in some way with uh, PAT that, that's a great question and is exactly suggestive of uh, or I, I, I'd say is a, a generalization of an example that I gave earlier here of a wind tunnel so we didn't actually do an experiment with a wind tunnel uh, <laughs> Sort of truth in marketing, but uh, in principle, one could. And uh, when you solve the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, you're typically discretizing the grid and having to kind of keep track of velocities and pressures at each grid point. Whereas in the actual physical system, when you run it, when you actually make a wind tunnel, you go to Boeing and you see their wind tunnel, uh, the physical system itself is naturally extremely highly parallel. Uh, and so that's exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to exploit. So if you think about uh, what physical systems might actually be able to give you some advantage over doing things just in a digital computer? Uh, it's good to think of physical systems that intrinsically have some like massively parallel amount of things going on. Uh, and a wind tunnel, I think, is a very 
a sort of visual example of this, but there are other ones as well. You can think of electromagnetic systems where uh, if you want to solve it on a digital computer, you have to discretize to some fine grid, uh, but in the physical system where you kind of run currents through some exotic uh, material, uh, it's uh, or you send microwave electromagnetic fields through it, it's intrinsically happening in some kind of parallel way. Uh, and so this is not something that we exploited to a large extent in the experiments that I, I've shown so far, and that I will show a few more examples shortly, but they all did have some aspect of parallelism to them, and I think as a future sort of prospect for the field, uh, it, it's good to think about physical systems that have a lot of uh, parallel things going on, because that's uh, something that could have made them difficult to simulate by a digital machine. And so it contributes to the notion somehow they're intrinsically doing something that's complicated. Thank you, Peter. Um, ten minute flag. Awesome. So this was uh, showing this physics aware training procedure for uh, succeeding at some relatively simple bar classification task, but also uh, showing that if you didn't use it, that uh, it would, the, the, the system would fail. Um, so now let's look at some other examples. So I'm now going to show you three examples of performing handwritten digit classification. So our famous uh, slut goes eight. Uh, and I'm going to show you that, that we managed to do this with three different, very different physical systems. So the first one that we're showing here is a mechanical system. And so this is literally a piece of metal that is mounted to an audio speaker. And the speaker is shaking the piece of metal. Uh, so in physics terms, you can think of it as a multi-mode mechanical oscillator, but just in sort of normal terms, this is a piece of metal that's being shaken. And the, uh, the input to the system is uh, some current or voltage to a speaker uh, that encodes both the data you're trying to classify as well as parameters. And then the output is uh, a microphone that is recording the sound that this, uh, this speaker, that this piece of metal makes when it's sh shaken. And you could, have you could imagine other outputs that are possible with this. You could have kind of had a camera look at the distortions of the metal or something, but the, the one that we used was, a, was the audio output. And we implemented a three-layer neural network and managed to achieve this confusion matrix here, which shows kind of for a given digit that we put in, what prediction do we make? And uh, the ideal result would have been the diagonal is all 100, uh, saying that every time you put in a zero, you got out a you made a, that you made a correct prediction of a zero every time you put in a one, made a correct prediction of a one, etc. And so this, uh, you can see that the, it's a pretty dark and the, the numbers are pretty high, so uh, it's achieving a pretty good accuracy, but there's still some, some things where it gets it wrong. Uh, and the overall accuracy, if you average over all of these, was around 90%. So it's, it's pretty, pretty good in the, in the sense of 90% uh, is a reasonable accuracy. Uh, if you just think, oh, 90% of the time it gets the digit right, Compared to state-of-the-art machine learning methods, even from sort of a couple of decades ago, it's not that great because on this task you should be able to achieve some 98 or 99 percent, even with a relatively simple artificial neural network. But still, this was done with a piece of metal that you are shaking. This was not a system that was very carefully designed to perform MNIST handwritten digit classification, and it is maybe even a little bit surprising that something so simple uh, can be trained to perform classification of this. Yeah, this task that had nothing to do with the physical system itself. Sorry, Peter Kukosh, could you explain again how the encoding of what the encoding of the input image looks like into into the membrane? Sure. So the input image gets encoded as a. Uh, I mean, it's slightly more complicated than this, but basically the way to think about it is it encoded in the time waveform of a voltage that's sent to the speaker. So you take some pixel value and you encode that in some. Bin, bin of time, and then the next pixel value, and you encode that in some next bin of time, et cetera. And then the, the output is uh, also a voltage versus time waveform, where we, in this case, we're doing a, a time bidding of the first, uh, the first time slot that corresponds to uh, digit zero, the second time slot that corresponds to digit one, et cetera. And kind of whichever time slot had the highest amplitude, you could interpret that as the output of kind of which, uh, which digit had you fed in. And um, how do you change the parameters here? Right, so the tunable parameters are uh, also encoded in the input waveform. It's another part of the temporal waveform. And uh, how they get trained is using this procedure, 
but yeah, how they're encoded is just another part of the, the temporal waveform that gets put into the speaker. Okay. So th these examples are, have a slightly unfortunate aspect. They're a little bit convolved. There's not really such a very strong separation between what was input data and what was parameters uh, because we were encoding both the input and the parameters in the same way. It didn't, doesn't have to be that way, though. You can imagine a physical system where you send the input data via the voltage to the speaker, but you train the data, you train the system by deforming the metal plate in some way. Uh, we just didn't happen to do that experiment because it turns out that uh, it would be really slow to run something where you want to, every time you want to change the parameters, you mechanically deform the, the piece of metal. But in principle, you could do it. Okay, right, right. You're not changing the strain or stress or, or any of that. On the... Right, but you could imagine that, like, you could make a physical mechanical neural network doing that. It just, uh, it's a pretty difficult experiment to do because you need to somehow, you, you would really like to automate the way of changing the stress at every point in space within the piece of metal uh, uh, rather than doing it by graduate student descent of somebody poking it with pins <laughs> and running through the new yeah. data set and seeing if it improved. Because you need to cycle through this, uh, a fair number of times, this is not even for MNIST, this is for this valve task, but MNIST is more complicated. You need to do this, and each epoch is corresponding to actually sending the whole data set through or some large fraction of the data set a number of times. Like You need to run this, the data set through the system many times with many different updates to the parameters. So you want to do this in an automated way, and so having something where the inputs are electrical is convenient. <laughs> Great. So this was, a, this was a demonstration with a mechanical system, and this is not to say that we believe a mechanical system is going to beat a GPU at machine learning processing. This is more to make the point that you can really take very obscure or like not fit to task physical systems and somehow make them perform machine learning processing for you uh, on somewhat sophisticated tasks, like handwritten digit classification. Um, and so maybe this is even a little bit surprising. We were very happy that this worked out. Here's another example of something that is also very clearly not designed to, to task. This is a circuit that uh, was built in the home uh, of, uh, of uh, Logan Wright, who was one of the postdocs who led this project during the, the COVID lockdown, so he had to do the work at home. And you can see that the circuit, I think he will not be offended if I say this looks like a middle schooler's first attempt at a breadboard circuit. This is very clearly not a very carefully engineered electronic circuit for performing machine learning processing. This is an RLC circuit with discrete components where you've also added in a transistor because an RLC circuit is linear and we know from the vast machine learning literature that nonlinearity is very important in many machine learning tasks. So you add in a transistor to have some nonlinearity. And again here, the way that in input data, the, the handwritten digits are fed in is via voltage uh, that goes to some node of the circuit and then the output is a voltage in another node of the circuit. So the input data and the parameters come in in some temporal waveform and the output is also recorded as some temporal waveform. Could you highlight where the nonlinearity was in the mechanical case? In the mechanical case, the system is not that nonlinear to begin with, but it's a piece of metal that you can imagine has nonlinear response to, to being shaken. Um, in the particular case of this experiment, I think this piece of metal was actually not, not super nonlinear. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you, you could imagine a material that has a that that has a non-trivial amount of nonlinear nonlinear response to kind of how it's shaken. I see. So linear would work for these cases, but maybe nonlinear will do a little bit better as the data seems to maybe suggest at the bottom. Right. Yeah. So that's a, that, that's a great point. It's getting to something that's maybe a little subtle, but I, I think since you brought it up, it's it's useful to mention is that it turns out that for MNIST handwritten digit classification. In conventional artificial neural network machine learning literature, I think the state of the, uh, I think the, the limit to a linear classifier is something like 92% accuracy. So if you do better than 92%, you've, you must have done something that was nonlinear. And uh, well, we'll see shortly at least one example of where that was true. I think maybe even in this electronic one, we were beating the 92% limit. I didn't put the average down here. But uh, just, just eyeballing it, it looks like it might be above 92. But we'll get to a third example where it really definitely is. So anyway, so this is the confusion matrix for, uh, for this electronic system, which again is a, not designed to task, but yet somehow this can perform handwritten digit classification on handwritten digits. And, uh, and the final and example. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say, oh, maybe show the final example and then I'll ask the question.
So uh, the final example is the same optic setup that I showed earlier. This nonlinear optical conversion process with a, a, a pulse shaper to encode the input data and the, out, and the parameters and a spectrometer to, uh, to read out the output was used also to perform handwritten digit classification. It was a slightly more complicated architecture that was implemented than the one I showed for the, the, the vowel classification. But in this case, uh, you can now see that this confusion matrix is clearing up quite nicely. We're getting very close to a straight diagonal. And this one was achieving 97% accuracy. Uh, and so this is well above that sort of 92% linear limit for, uh, for, for MNIST. Question. Right. Um, this one's from Gilm and Janani, uh, related on inductive bias. So would, would, would be interesting to see if the natural physics of a given system confer an inductive bias advantage from the similar kind of underlying symmetries or behaviors as the data, for example, for neural FEM simulations. And are we going to have some inductive bias while using the different physical systems for the forward pass? Uh, is this account accommodated during the training? Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, basically any neural network architecture you have will have some inductive bias, meaning some task that it's kind of better suited to, to doing. Uh, you, you're not going to, there's no, no free lunch theorem. So uh, anything, will, anything you do will have inductive bias. And it's kind of interesting to ask, well, what is the inductive bias of different physical systems? And this gets to something I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk, which is that I can promise you we can you can give me any physical system and we can make it into a neural network view so long as it has rep repeatable behavior. Um, but I can't promise you that it will be a good neural network for any particular task. And so that really yeah, connects with, well, what is the inductive bias of each of these individual types of physical systems and other physical systems? And so something that's maybe slightly surprising, or uh, maybe more than slightly surprising, is that these physical systems that had nothing to do with handwritten digit classification were actually able to do it at all because uh, we weren't even sure that that would be possible when we began this project. Um, but these different physical systems are maybe better or worse suited to handwritten digit classification versus other tasks. And so the maybe most natural inductive bias for each of these physical systems is imagine your machine learning task was to effectively do something related to the simulation of that particular physical system. Then the physical system should be super well matched to it. And there's got to be some kind of continuum from there to arbitrary tasks. And so it's a very interesting question of for any given, given physical system, what is, what is its inductive bias? So what would it, what machine learning tasks would it be good at? Um, and I think this is a very interesting and general question that one could try to answer in different ways for different physical systems and different tasks. Uh, and then we're just beginning to get started. Basically, our, our work that I've shown all the experimental results I'm going to show for now, uh, we've managed to show that we can do this with these simple systems, but you then yeah, immediately have this whole range of questions of like, well, what, what physical system would be good for what task? And what if you had given a physical system, how would you work out what inductive bias it has, et cetera? So I think it's uh, a very interesting and rich uh, area of, of, of potential study. So let me uh, quickly end off this section by saying, uh, uh, by following what I just essentially just said, of, well, we demonstrated with three very simple systems. None of these things are anywhere close to beating, let alone a GPU, even a CPU from sort of many years ago. They're very simple physical systems. So what are, what are some candidates for things where you can imagine actually constructing a physical system that could act as a neural network that might actually give you a performance advantage? Well, you really want to look for physical systems that are difficult to simulate, but that also have an inductive bias that's actually useful for the things you want to do, and that have some kind of energy or speed argument to them. And clearly, an oscillating mechanical plate going at sort of kilohertz is uh, neither energy efficient nor fast, so that's not it. Uh, but what are some things that could be interesting? So I think there's a lot of different possible physical systems one might want to explore this with. You could imagine things with spintronic nano oscillators, which have some really interesting benefits and features of being very low switching energy, very small, very fast. You could imagine doing things with superconducting ele electronics, even in the classical regime. Uh, you could imagine doing things with, uh, with optical or material systems like uh, excitons and 2D materials. Um, but there are many other possible physical systems where this could be interesting. And we've released our code for doing this. So if you're interested in just trying out on your own, we also have some demos. You can download the code. And we're also happy to chat with anyone who has 
some potential physical system they think might be interesting to do this with, um, you know, please uh, feel free to get in touch with us if, you, if there's anything you'd like to discuss along these lines. So I wanted to, to end off with a, a, a quick nod to quantum, given the, uh, the title of the seminar series, um, which is, what is the prospect for building a quantum physical neural network in the way that, we've, uh, that I've, I've outlined in this talk? And we can think about this as maybe a complementary approach to uh, maybe what one might call a conventional quantum neural network approaches that people have been exploring so intensively over the last few years with the uh, near-term uh, quantum computers, these noisy intermediate scale quantum machines that uh, IBM and others are, are constructing. So the notion of quantum neural networks is, is really not, not new. The, it goes back to at least the early 90s. Um, but there's been this big resurgence of interest in the, in the field since at least around 2018. Here's a one representative paper from a team at Google uh, proposing and demonstrating in simulation uh, performing of handwritten digit classification using a, a quantum circuit that you can train the parameters of various gates within the quantum circuit and be able to make a, a prediction uh, for a machine learning task. And uh, this is just two papers out of out of many, many, many recent papers, this other work here called Quantum Circuit Learning from, uh, from Fuji and his collaborators uh, made a sort of pretty generalized formulation of this of in a quantum circuit. You could have some, uh, you start with all your qubits in the zero state. You have some unitary that encodes your input data, uh, for example, your handwritten digit that you want to classify, and then some unitary that performs some operation on this that is parameterized by some uh, parameters theta, ve vector theta here. Uh, and this can be, you can optimize some loss function via uh, some gradient descent algorithm or other algorithms for optimization. And this connects very uh, strongly with other forms of variational quantum circuits for quantum chemistry and optimization and so on as well. But in quantum neural networks, one is trying to use this circuit to perform machine learning. And so this, is, this has been a very active and interesting area of research. Um, I think it's complementary to, to the kind of thing that we're talking about here, where imagine that we have some physical system that instead of being a classical system is some quantum system. But now instead of it being a quantum system that somebody's really carefully engineered to be very well controllable and do exactly the thing that you tell it to do, um, like the conventional circuit model quantum computers that uh, many people in academia and in industry are constructing, Imagine you replace this with a physical system that is not specifically designed to be a great quantum computer. That is just some dissipative, poorly calibrated quantum system. Our procedure and philosophy of constructing neural networks is essentially something that could let you build, that they could let you harness this uh, very much not a nice circuit model quantum computer quantum system to do machine learning for you anyway. And uh, what would be the way to do this equivalent of the differentiable digital model that you have in the classical sense that I, the setting that I introduced? Well, maybe this is something that actually you would use a circuit model quantum computer to do the, to help you with the training of this fully designed or not carefully designed quantum, uh, quantum system. So this is some rough thoughts on kind of how these ideas might tra translate to the quantum realm. It's certainly not the only way you can imagine doing things. Um, but I think it's very interesting to think about uh, what, are, what are ways that you can harness complex quantum behavior that is not carefully engineered uh, or not as carefully engineered as when you're sort of on the roadmap to a fault-tolerant circuit model quantum machine. Uh, so my group is actively working on this, uh, on this area, but I think there's a lot of scope for, for other people to, to do interesting things in this. And so I'm excited to see how this, uh, this sort of branch of quantum neural networks develops. Uh, so with that, I'll leave up the summary slide that we've shown a new way to harness physical systems to perform uh, machine learning computation, that our physics-aware training procedure really gives you a systematic way to build physical neural networks out of a given physical device, uh, and that it does it in a way that's robust to analog noise. We actually demonstrated this with three real things in a real lab, subject to real noise, um, and you can get it to actually work. Uh, we showed it with mechanical, electrical, and optical systems just to show that it's really general. Um, and that there's this, uh, I think, interesting future direction of applying this to quantum systems. Uh, so I'll leave, leave it with for there for now, and uh, thank you all for your attention and all the great questions so far, and I look forward to, to some more questions and discussion now. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, folks. Uh
please feel free to repost or add new questions. Um, I know I missed a few questions during the talk, just in the interest of time. One question from Patrick O'Brien was, uh, perhaps I missed this, but is the gradient descent approach robust against getting stuck in local minima? This was <laughs> in the, uh, I think, first part of the experiment. Right, right. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would say that in our case, it's basically the same situation as it is for artificial neural networks, uh, which is that, yes, in principle, gradient descent can get stuck in local minima. In practice, what people have found in the deep learning community is that the landscape is such that there are many local minima you can get stuck in, but those local minima tend to be, tend to actually be pretty good. And I, there's, uh, but we don't basically have any reason to believe why, if you made the physical, uh, made the layers out of arbitrary physical systems, why the local minima would somehow be way worse than the ones that you find in artificial networks. And empirically, the the practical results we achieve suggest that that, that, that that's reason that, that that was a reasonable guess. Uh, I guess it's TBD in the future of like if you make more sophisticated physical systems and turn them into neural networks, uh, will you somehow find yourself in weird lost landscapes where actually the local minima are not good? But uh, my guess would be that this isn't going to be a problem. And from your dear Maya, kind of a follow up to the previous question. Is there some prescription to how the physical systems are chosen? I think you touched on that, but uh, if you have anything to add to that, mostly in terms of complexity in general, the more trainable parameters we have, the better results we expect. Is that, oh, maybe that's the second question. Sorry. Does that translate in some way? Let's, let's stick with the, uh, how do you choose the physical system? Sure. I mean, although the, I think those two things are, are kind of connected, so I can actually answer them together, which is, yeah, so what is our ingredient for sort of or our recipe for picking a good physical system if we want to think about something that might actually be able to beat CMOS electronics one day? Um, is uh, you, you, can you can imagine, well, it would be good to pick physical systems where it's really hard to simulate them on a laptop. Like if it's already easy to simulate that physical system, then it's, it's, it's not going to help you by, or give you an advantage by building it out of a laptop. That's a necessary but not sufficient condition, though, because it can turn out that a system was really hard to simulate on a laptop, but the complexity that it had made it hard to simulate, but wasn't necessarily useful for the particular machine learning task you were trying to do. Uh, so, yeah, it's necessary but not sufficient, but you, you want to at least start with systems that are hard to simulate, so that have some intrinsic complexity to them. And like one of the questions earlier I suggested, like, well, one thing that could be... Uh, could make a system hard to simulate is that it, it naturally has a lot of parallelism. Another one is that it could naturally be very high speed or bandwidth. So optics is an example of where the simulations can sometimes be really tricky, partially because uh, optics has potentially sort of hundreds of terahertz of bandwidth. And so now there's a, a notion of parallelism within sort of frequency space that's going on uh, that can be tricky for digital computers to deal with, but in optics naturally happens. Um, but another very important aspect of it is that from conventional artificial neural network literature, we know that adding parameters generally helps you. And we've seen this trend over the last decade or so. I mean, it goes back even longer than that, but especially over the last decade or so, it's become very clear that like, to get better performance in deep learning, you need to make models that just have more parameters. And the more parameters you add, the better things get. Um, and so I, we have no reason to believe that this wouldn't also be true with the physical neural network case. So it's good to think about what physical neural networks or physical systems uh, could really give you a lot of input parameters, a lot of parameters that you can control. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it really stands to reason that the more, the better in general. Uh, and, and this is something that's kind of tricky because many physical systems do something complicated, but they don't actually have a very high dimensional input and output that you can kind of really touch. Um, so it's a, it's a tricky part of the design of these things going forward, I think, is to try to find ones that really let you control an enormous number of parameters. Like, I mean, even a million is small by modern large neural network standards. You really want something that's, that's gigantically large uh, if you're going to compete with CMOS. Another thing that I have not emphasized at all in this talk, but I think is maybe this is a good time to mention it, is in one line of this work is you can think about, like, can we make physical systems somehow beat a, a GPU or a TPU or a CPU even. Um, and that might be, well, not might be, that's going to be really hard because CMOS has been engineered to, for 50 plus years and is really amazing. Um, but we can also imagine trying to construct physical neural networks that, are, that have a more of a home ground advantage. If you imagine constructing a, an optical system 
that is going to take as input, not some electronic database of vowel sounds or whatever, but is going to be looking at a scene out of a self-driving car. And the, the scene is just going to be kind of coming into the optical system. You can imagine getting a benefit, uh, more easily getting a benefit there because now you're avoiding sort of optics to electronics conversion costs. Uh, and it's more competing on the natural data that's natural to it. Another example that I think is quite interesting is if you imagine sort of smart dust of like very tiny sensors that are mechan electromechanical objects that kind of maybe sit on walls or whatever that are self-powered. Like you want to have a, maybe a very, very low energy neural network that it's, it's, the system is even too small for you to put it in, like a tiny arm processor or something into it. You want the system just from its dynamics of its electromechanical uh, response to be able to sense something that happened in the environment mechanically and then turn on a radio or whatever if something interesting happened. Uh, so something where like the natural domain was me mechanics and then you built the neural network out of mechanics. I think those are two examples of uh, things within the generally the field of smart sensors where physical neural networks could have a much more natural advantage over CMOS and then that also suggests, well, what kind of physical system should you, you pick? It's like, well, one that matches the sort of the type of input data you want to process. 30, 30 second response here. Um, your, how does your model deal with probability of occurring barren plateaus increasing exponentially with scale up? Sure. So, um, in the case of the classical uh, physical systems, I think uh, barren plateaus don't seem to be much of an issue. Uh, the, the lost landscape is complicated, but it tends to not, tends to not have uh, places where the where where you get low, small gradients. In the quantum case. Um, uh, there's, of course, been a lot of interesting literature in quantum neural networks finding that for general choices of ansatz, uh, you often find that the, the, there are barren plateaus in the lost landscape, and people have worked a lot to try to figure out how to, how to design the ansatz a little differently so that you can avoid this, uh, this, this uh, barren plateau. And I think as in the extension of this kind of work to quantum neural networks, one would want to try to leverage that literature to be careful about how to design the system so that you don't have uh, big barren plateaus that you can get stuck in or how you can initialize things so that you can avoid them. Uh, another aspect of things is that the dissipation might help. Um, uh, there's some continuum between completely classical and completely quantum, and in the completely classical case, we don't seem to have problems with barren plateaus. So maybe as you make things more dissipative, it actually might help you, which is sort of a little unusual to hear in a quantum setting, but uh, it can sometimes actually be true. Awesome. Um, I think we'll... <laughs> And with this comment from one of our previous Kiskit seminar, IBM Quantum Kiskit seminar speakers, Guillaume Verdome, who says, Gradient descent is the best optimization algorithm, never fails. Ha <laughs> ha. It's, uh, it's just not the fastest. <laughs> it's not the fastest, which was actually the other comment uh, that I'm going to have to skip over and apologize to everyone whose questions we won't get to is, you know, it'd be interesting to see a wall clock time benchmark uh, of this back propagation and gradient approach versus simply using a black box evolutionary strategy like CMAES or something like that. I think those are open. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to think about if you can train physical neural networks with other approaches besides backprop. Um, and we're interested in things, not just black box, black box things and genetic algorithms and so on, but other approaches, uh, things like equilibrium propagation and uh, feedback alignment. There's many interesting approaches to trying to train things beyond backprop, and I think it's a, an interesting future direction to try uh, carefully compare them. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. For um, by the way, there are a lot of comments saying great talk, great session. Uh, I'll let you read those after. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, tune in next Friday at east at 12 o'clock Eastern time. Um, Actually, I will be speaking, so I'll be, I need to find a host, but I will be the hostee. And uh, with that, Peter, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Thank you for taking all the questions. We will see you next Friday at noon Eastern time. Awesome. Thanks very much, everyone.